All right, people, we are live on the YouTube. I believe you know that I'm Dave Rubin, and this is a very special episode of the Rubin Report. You know, we're doing this live stream thing now. We just got all the technology in the new studio here. We can now live stream to YouTube and to Facebook and to Periscope and a couple other places, and we've got a few other tricks up our sleeve. Uh, but today we're going directly to YouTube on this. Uh, just a quick uh, little recap before I bring on my guest today. Uh, I've done two interviews today that I think sort of get to the heart of everything that I kind of do that I'm very excited about. So I usually don't tease the interviews before we release them, uh, but I'll do that today. So this morning I had Glenn Beck in here, which was uh, really great. You know, he's, a, he's an interesting guy for a million reasons. Even just tweeting about him this morning, Half the people immediately hate him, half the people love him, half the people just send me pictures of him snorting Cheetos. Weird stuff. But we had a really, really great discussion about liberty and individualism and, and sort of common ground and can some of us who don't agree on every little thing politically come together to form this new center? Hint, I think the answer is yes. Uh, and then I just interviewed a really fascinating guy uh, by the name of Fleming Rose. And if you don't know who he is, you at least know his work because he was the editor of the Danish newspaper that published the Muhammad cartoons back in 2005, which caused sort of worldwide mayhem and 200 uh, dead people. And, and we talk, had a great discussion about uh, free speech and uh, religion and secularism and all that good stuff. So for those of you watching this right now, if you are in the LA area, I'm actually gonna be speaking at UCLA tomorrow, Wednesday night, with Fleming Rose and Steve Simpson from the Ayn Rand Institute. And it's open for students at UCLA and for regular citizens. So uh, come, and, come and say hi. And I spoke at uh, Portland State University this weekend, which was fantastic, with Christina Hoff Summers and Pete Bogosian. And it was just great, 400 kids that wanted to talk about freedom and free speech. And it was wonderful. And they even ca they canceled the protest. They said we were fascists, and then the, the anti-fascists didn't show up. I guess they were playing video games or something. Anyway, the reason we're doing this live today is because of this executive order that Trump signed in the last couple of days, which everyone is calling a Muslim ban. I have the actual text of the whole thing right here. I have read it. It's a couple pages long. I've read the whole thing. I shot my direct message for tomorrow, which will be for our episode with Glenn Beck. It has the entirety of my thoughts on the uh, executive order and all that. But I thought what we could do today, because I wanted to get a little ahead on this, is talk to my, to my friend and now three-time Ruben Report guest. I think he's only the second three-timer. Uh, Faisal Saeed Al-Mutar in New York. How are you, brother? Hey, Dave, how are you? Can I, I'm doing well. Congratulations on the new studio, by the way. What's that? Congratulations on the new studio. Oh, thank you. You know, we got to do this live. I think you're going to be in LA in a couple of weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah, we got to catch up as well. It's been a while. It it has been a while. All right. So here's how I want to start. I'm going to give a brief intro, and then I want you to tell the story of Faisal. So you are a refugee. You are an actual Iraqi refugee. You came to America about three years ago, I believe. Uh, you have a green card right now. Uh, we've become good friends. I consider you one of the stalwart fighters for Western secular values, dealing with the difficult issues of Islamism and the difference between criticizing ideas and people, all of the stuff that I know my audience cares about. Uh, but for the people that don't know who you are, let's, let's put a face on what's going on here before we get to the order itself. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, um, so the, I, I've been here four years. Um, I arrived in March 2013. So, yeah. So where to start? So yeah, I was I was born right after the first uh, the first Iraq War. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite younger than most people expect. Um, I, I was re lived my childhood under Saddam Hussein, and then the U.S. intervention, and followed by the uh, the civil war between uh, the Sunni and Shia factions. Um, I start kind of my my kind of uh, motion to activism started around the first Iraqi election in 2005 when I saw the rise of sectarianism around there and, and, and then the sectarian language especially and the rise of sectarian parties uh, that eventually ruled the country. So I was I was raised in a liberal Muslim household. That may sound an oxymoron for some of the people, but I do believe that that thing actually exists. 
Um, so can, I, can you describe what that means, actually, if you live in a, mu a liberal Muslim household in Iraq? What does that actually mean? Yeah, so, so I, I consider myself very lucky in that regard. Uh, so my, my dad uh, studied, my dad, I think my mom as well, they both studied in the United Kingdom, and my dad is a medical doctor, my mom is a lawyer. Um, and I was raised mostly, I mean, the person I had most relationship with when it comes to intellectual conversations was my dad. Uh, so his view is that he's a, he's a Muslim, some extent practicing, uh, has his doubts. Uh, and he said that faith is not something to be imposed. So I want you as my son, my youngest son, Faisal Mutar, uh, to read and to explore. And uh, if you want to be a Muslim, be a Muslim. If you don't want to be a Muslim, that's fine. You are my son. I'll, I'll always get to love you. So, yeah, by the time I was 12 and started uh, start reading, uh, I think I mentioned that in the previous show, started reading about different religions and so on. And uh, it didn't make sense at all. And I told my dad that this actually does not make sense. And even though he's a Muslim himself, uh, said, okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm glad as long as you're intellectually honest with yourself. So that's kind of what I, that, that's, I mean, I, I mean, that actually may sound like liberal even compared to the United States, I assume, is that, <laughs> that the <laughs> idea of being uh, raised in such family. So, so I was raised in this background, and then the moment I, so I looked, it was kind of a bubble, to say the least. So I, I go outside the house, and then there's like a clash of civilizations. Uh, between the kind of conservative, quite hypocritical society um, in Iraq. And, I, and, I, and as a result, I started getting uh, some threats and, and so on from militias because at the time, in 2005, 2006, 2007, if people are familiar with, uh, Al-Qaeda kind of took over some parts of West Baghdad. They did not take over them like Al-Qaeda, ISIS now takes over Mosul and stuff. But, but in terms of like, you see like Al-Qaeda fighters walking around and you see like, some dead bodies that I had to walk on going to school. And uh, I saw like people getting killed in front of my eyes and so on. So that's, and I still remember like one of the first weeks uh, in my high school, it was when Al Qaeda attacked the police station in front of, of my school and like most of the class were destroyed. So fast forward to, 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 to a bit modern time. In 2007, uh, my eldest brother, Samar, uh, was going to work with three of his friends, and he was stopped by a false checkpoint of Al Qaeda, and they kidnapped him, and we didn't know what happened. He just disappeared, and, and some of his friends said that he was kidnapped by militia of Al Qaeda, and it took us months and months and months. And my mom and my dad always like hearing news that oh we found him over there, we found him over there, blah blah blah. So eventually the area that was, uh, my brother was kidnapped, the Iraqi police, uh, I think the US military as well, fi figured out the Al-Qaeda people, and then they showed a picture of my brother, and one of the people said that, yes, I killed the guy. And then they showed the picture of his uh, other three friends. Um, within also that same year, that was at the end of 2007, um, Al-Qaeda came to my cousin's shop, which is kind of like a, Delhi, like he sells groceries and stuff, and they came and, and they shot him and killed him. Um, so things were all bubbling up. Uh, I, I've lost some friends, all of that, and the situation like, kept getting worse and worse. Uh, I left Iraq in 2009. I just trying to just escape my life. And one of the easiest countries for me to go to at the time was Lebanon, because Lebanon allows if you have like a thousand dollars, you show it at the entry, they, they give you like a visitor visa. And I was supposed to apply to the UK, and they rejected me three times, uh, one after the other. Uh, uh, they have like also all kinds of threat regulations. They, they were asking for thousands of dollars in the savings account and stuff. And I was just like, just escaping, like Al Qaeda killing me. Right. Okay. Wait. And let, let's just let's just pause there for a second because it almost sounds like there's a certain degree of bribery. I guess is the best way to put it that you have to pay to get into Lebanon, and then you were going to have to pay again to get transit yeah. basically to the UK. That's why you see many Saudis uh, walking around London and, and here in Washington, New York, and Los Angeles where you live, uh -huh. because they have the money, right? So then as a result, also Lebanon was bubbling up, and, and there was lots of Sunni Shia conflict happening there. And I was also afraid for my life because I'm a foreigner to some extent. So I I said, okay, in, in Malaysia, they, they give a kind of British education over there. So I went there and I applied for UNHCR, the United Nations Committee for Refugees. 
And then I applied and then I arrived in the United States in 2013. Within that period of struggle, um, I, I, I've generally been a writer, mostly kind of a small blogger. I also started the Global Secular Humanist page, which eventually yeah. became one of the largest in the world, the advocate for secularism and so on, which is kind of that, that's kind of my claim to fame. Um, and yeah, and here I am. So that's right. kind of my, my, small, my small biography. And, I, and people probably have seen me in case they watch some of the media and the news and social media and so on. Yeah, and you, you gave us a real truncated version of it there. But you know what? When we post this, um, once it's not live anymore, we'll have the link to our original sit-down where you extrapolate a little bit on some of the specifics. So, okay, you get to America, and I know you fairly well right now. You stand for what I think are pretty much the right things, whether we agree on every little thing is irrelevant yeah. to me. Uh, but you stand for, for secularism and Western values and decency, human decency and liberty yeah. and all that stuff. When you got here, what was it like being an Iraqi in America? Well, I mean, to tell you a bit of a funny story. So I landed in Los Angeles uh, when I arrived in the United States. And the first thing I went to was down, I thought I landed in Mexico. So my first post in, in America was, what the fuck did I just land in Mexico? <laughs> uh, because everybody around me was speaking Spanish, so I was like, "Wow, did I go to the wrong flight?" So, yeah, um, and I went to downtown Houston, uh, downtown Los Angeles, and it was not really interesting. So anyway, uh, but so I moved to Texas, where my brothers lived, and uh, I am very impressed. I mean, I, I love. Uh, I mean, I've been to forty states since I arrived to, to this country, and I was giving off talks and lectures around the country and so on, and. I'm very impressed. I mean, United States. I mean, I didn't expect the United States as big as as it is. Uh, so it seems like it's really big, and it's beautiful. I mean, I have a very beautiful hospitality story that a family in in uh, Washington D.C. invited me to first celebrate the first Fourth of July in my in, in in the United States. That was in 2013. That I consider right now to be my American family. So they invited me to Washington, and then. We celebrate the Fourth of July, and then after I moved to Washington D.C., I stayed. I lived with them for quite a while, and they treated me bigly, right? That's what Trump was. Um, good word. Good word. And uh, yeah, and, I, and I've I've seen kind of a face of a face of America that is very hospitable, very friendly, very lovely. Had some bad interactions here and there, like some freaking Hasidic Jew in New York telling me that I come from a dirty land and I'm responsible for Jewish genocide and so on. I mean, I've, 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 they're like some burger place saying me, go back to Iraq, go back to Iraq and all of that shit. But in general, I mean, looking at the big picture, I would say the United States showed me a very friendly face. Uh, people, at least the bubble I live in of people who think kind of like us and mostly liberal or center left, center right and so on, uh, except me as you just beautifully said that you consider me a fighter for liberal values and human rights and so on. So, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I consider the United States right now to be my home. I am very lucky to be here, very lucky to have been accepted. And that is kind of the result why I've kind of I don't know if you have noticed in the past three days is that uh, I've been very critical of all the Trump band because I know, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't consider myself a special to some extent I because I, I know a lot of the liberal, amazing people within Iraq and Saudi Arabia and so on. And I would love them to have this experience. I would love them to see uh, that there is another side of the West than, I mean, my first experience with the United States, probably, I've talked about this before, was to seeing a U.S. tank going in front of my house. That's the first time I meet an American. Right, uh, that, that's not a great intro. Exactly, and, and I saw, like, and then the war, and they're like, all of what I've seen is that U.S. people sitting in Humvees and firing bullets at extremists and Al-Qaeda coming in and they're fighting rockets. So this is kind of my experience with the kind of the, and, and obviously, I mean, I assume some of them are good people. <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, generally, I mean, it's U.S. Army is U.S. Army and they have to do military stuff. But like, this is, I, I mean, I've met U.S. military before in, in Iraq, and they were also friendly and stuff, but that's kind of like, it was mostly a military, but coming here and seeing the civilian life and seeing what Americans are like, uh, 
change my view about lots of things. And uh, consider that someone who grew up in Dar Saddam and all of the U.S. propaganda, Iraq propaganda, Dar Saddam against the U.S. being the Satan and so on. Uh, my experience coming to America and seeing the different cultures and living now in one of the most diverse cities in, in the world uh, kind of opened my eyes and that's kind of motivates me to always constantly defend the United States, whether in public forums or private forums or even defend it in any way possible, working counter extremism. How can we uh, de defeat ISIS and all of these groups? And I would like as much as possible to get this opportunity given to as many people as possible who are escaping danger, who are in the same situation as I am. And uh, yes, I've been very critical of the ban. Maybe. Okay, so let's let's pause yeah, let's yeah. pause there for a sec because I want I want to just do one other thing before we talk about the band yep. specifically, which is your work, which I know is a little bit in transition right now. But yes. a lot of the work that you do, and by the way, you're in New York. I don't know if we mentioned that earlier. You said one of the most diverse places, but just FYI, you are in yeah. New York. Um, a lot of the work that you've done and that you do is directly related to helping people in closed societies. You're trying to find the individuals in these societies that are the most vulnerable to extremism. You're the atheists, the gay people, the free thinkers, et cetera, et cetera. And you're trying to get these ideas to flourish, to untie them from religion. Is that all fair to say? Well, to, to, to some extent, I mean, I, 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 I consider myself, my work is, is a mix of humanitarianism and also to do damage control. I mean, the, the, I, I think that the people, the voices of, of the, the support to human rights and secularism and all of the values that we stand for is the best counter narrative to extremism. And, and extremism for me, and, 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 and obviously being kind of on the receiving end of extremism, of losing my brother and losing, obviously I have some emotional reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing, but, but also rational reasons is that there are people within these regions, in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, who are living in these places and literally have nobody to help them. So, I mean, I, I wrote this article recently about how it's easier to start a terrorist group in the Middle East than to start a liberal one. And one of the main reasons for that is not just because of lack of moderates or lack of liberals and so on, is because if you start a terrorist group, let's say in Iraq, and you're a Sunni extremist, you have millions of dollars coming to you from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and so on. You are a Shia militia, you get millions of dollars coming from Iran. And if you are a liberal who stands for the, most of the values that we stand for, you hardly you work as a taxi driver and can hardly feed your family. And that's, right. that balance is something is that balance is something that I'm I would say I'm dedicating my life to change. Is that this is this is unfair that for example, Raif Ra Badawi and his other bloggers are like just having a blogs on the internet while like channels like Al Jazeera Arabic that calls for killing of of, of homosexuals and misogyny and all of these things. Are, are saving millions of gas money, gas, uh, natural gas and oil, and, I, and, and and these are the people that we should help. And I, being the the privileged in that regard, that I'm, I was one of the people who escaped that part of the world. I'm bilingual, not bisexual, just so I can <laughs> get clear. Whatever, uh, this is America, dude. Whatever yeah, floats yeah. your boat. Um, so bilingual, well connected, educated, and so on. I would like to spread that uh, and help spreading this idea. So yeah, my work, uh, people probably favor with the Obstacle Humans Movement, movements.org, and I'm starting my new organization, Ideas Beyond Borders, that's gonna happen in the next few weeks. So this is it's mostly been around this kind of ideas, is that get these people uh, the best counter narrative to extremists, get them the maximum help as possible to defeat the extremists. And that's that's what I'm uh, the mission of my life. Yeah, and by the way, you know, some of the work that you do you know, it's nice that you get some of these public accolades, but some of the work, you know, there's somebody that we can't even really go into the story right now that we've been trying to help facilitate a free thinker that we've been trying to get out of Iraq that could be complicated now because of this whole executive order. So let's, exactly. let's, shift, let's shift to this thing. So as I said in my direct message that I taped today and it'll be up tomorrow, I read it. I actually okay. read it. I know you read it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the people that are online and on television, I don't think they actually read it. They just start screaming about it. So we can go through every point in there if you want. We can, we can talk about the parts that are more personal to you because the green card for you is a very important piece. The first part that I just want to put out there, and, and maybe you disagree with me, and feel free, obviously, is that 
in my view, this is not a Muslim ban because if you took the top five countries that Muslim people live in, including Indonesia and Pakistan, uh, there's over 750 million Muslims that, this, uh, that are exempt from this, that aren't on the list. Now, we could argue whether the list is idiotic because Saudi Arabia is not on there and 19 of the 21 hijackers from 9-11 weren't on there. Pakistan's not on there, et cetera, et cetera. Turkey's not on there. Um, but do you think it's fair to say that this is not a Muslim ban? No, no I, I, think, I think it is. I mean, it's more complicated. Uh, so, so, for example, if, uh, I mean, within, for example, Iraq or some other countries, uh, people who are... Uh, of Israeli citizenship are not allowed to enter Iraq, right? Yeah. But Iraqi Jews are allowed, sorry, American Jews are allowed to enter Iraq because American. But so somebody can say that the, the banning against Israeli citizens coming to Iraq is a Jewish ban. Somebody can interpret that as a Jewish ban, which is partially true, right? I mean, Israel is the quote unquote the Jewish state and, and to ban the people come from Israel. So so here is why I do consider it partially to be a Muslim ban, is first of all, they put the caveat over there saying that religious minorities are exempt. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about Muslim majority countries and religious minorities are exempt, what, who are you actually talking about? You're talking about Muslims. So right. it, is, it is a partially Muslim ban on these countries. It's not, a, it's not an absolute Muslim ban in which which and the, the reason I think where the Muslim ban hashtag came from is I think is a result of the Trump speech after the San Bernardino attack when he said that I am Joel J. Trump, I'm going to make a complete shutdown of Muslims. When they saw this thing coming up, they will be like, OK, he said that in his campaign. And now he's saying that religious minorities are not part of the list of Muslim dominated countries. Therefore, it's a Muslim ban. I think that obviously this has been uh, hijacked, the cause has been hijacked by many people that we know, and, like CARE and their allies and, and, and their useful idiots on the left, right, who will, who will make yeah. them, who will make it all about uh, uh, open borders and how Islam is the peaceful religion and how there is no problem of extremism with the Muslim communities, and we should like let them all in. Obviously, just like everything is now being hijacked. I mean, I, I, like the Women's March. I, I was there for like uh, supporting Planned Parenthood, which I consider myself a big supporter of, and I'm very pro-choice myself. Uh, and I saw like people like defending the hijab and defending like, uh, which is a misogynistic symbol, right? It was like, and then like, I literally saw women with like wearing a bra and holding the, the symbol of hijab, the, the poster of the hijab. And you're like, you are wearing a bra and you are holding something of modesty culture. Like, shoot me in the fucking face, right? Like, so yeah. there is, so there is always, obviously, there is this hijack that happens in almost, unfortunately, every cause. I mean, you, you, we're talking about, like, you and I are very much against the aggressive left. And at the same time, you have, like, fucking neo-Nazis against the aggressive left, right? So, like, every cause uh, uh, that may, may start for the right reasons and, 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 and so on, unfortunately gets organized or gets hijacked by the people who are the most organized and unfortunately people like care and isna and all of the muslim organizations or some of them are islamists hijacked the cause and turned it into oh this is anti-islam and and there is no problem with islam and and, and everything is is less than kumbaya and, and have orgies right so like this is this kind of this kind of of, of but that doesn't mean that the main I would say like that that the, the, the there is no actual criticism of the uh, of the ban itself, and 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 I've been a victim of it. I mean, I I, I was supposed to get, I have multiple international talks, so uh, well, it's all focused on what around counter extremism and, and and the same job that I do. I have an event with our friend Al Rizvi in Toronto, and. Yes, and then I have a close family friend who went, a sort of close family member, who went to Iraq to visit a dead relative, and now we don't know if she's going to be able to make it back or not. So it is a blanket ban on on anybody who uh, who is Muslim or looks Muslim or has a Muslim name and so on. Uh, sorry, and also it sends a signal, a very bad signal. That, so so I think there was a, a Republican senator of the committee services made a very great. He said that. That there are two people who are wrong in this debate. The, the number one are the ones who say uh, jihadism has nothing to do with Islam. These are people are completely wrong. 
the Obama administration and, and, and their fellow allies within the left have publicized this idea that like we are that our enemy is countering violent extremism. And right. even though that they all invite like brown people with name Muhammad and Ali, and, and, but, the, but the name is countering violent extremism. Like, are you <laughs> kidding me, man? Like, who are you joking? Okay, so yeah. so there is this part of the that, and I agree that the US foreign policy with the administration has been far from great, and I've been critical of it all, all, all since I came to America and before I came to America. And there's the other side, who think who I think they think, and I and I wish to be wrong. I really wish to be wrong is that they don't really see any differentiation whatsoever between the likes of me and the likes of Osama bin Laden. Because we both have Muslim names or Arabic names, and we're both brown people coming from that part of the world, and it's their people and so on. So, so I, and, and that sends a signal. So, so within the left and the regressive left and the administration is that Islam has nothing to do with jihadism and so on. And within the alt-right or the far-right, whatever you want to call it, or the Trumpistan, as I like to call it, is that it is uh, every, every Middle Eastern and every Muslim coming from there is some source of a potential jihadist or a potential terrorist threat. And I think that within all this craziness, I'm really hoping that there is some kind of a middle ground and some balance that we can have. And I don't see that Trump ban is part of that balance. Right. Okay. So let's let's pause because you gave me a lot there. So first off, I mean, man, you're you're saying everything I believe. I don't think you said one thing there that I don't agree with. And it's been my mission now for the last two years to try to show people that there is a difference between this regressive ideology and the horrific authoritarian ideology, and that that most of us are in the middle. And I think we're making a lot of good headway there, which is why we have so many allies now, including. Ali Rizvi, who you just mentioned, and Sarah Hader, and Sam Harris, and Christina Hoff Summers, and a whole gajillion other people from all different walks of life. So I don't want to get too lost in the Muslim ban word, but I'm glad that, that we at least made the distinction between we're acknowledging it's not all Muslims. There might be some piece of this that is intended to be bigotry, bigoted, and maybe three months after the 90-day review, they're going to say all Muslims, in which case, of course, I would be against that. Um, what do you think about the seven country part? Because Saudi Arabia is not on there. How is yeah. that possible? Well, I mean, as a matter of principle, uh, I don't believe in the concept of collective guilt. I don't believe in the concept that we should punish countries or a group of people on the actions of even whether it was the minority or the majority. Because there are, as I said, there are tons of people like, if, if so, so even in country like Saudi Arabia, which is I'm probably going to be banned from from life, right? It's one of the most extreme. <laughs> yeah, I would not go to. Yeah. We're not vacationing uh, in Saudi Arabia, the two of us. Yeah, but I'm also like, if there is a ban on Saudi Arabia, I would be one of the first people protesting for it because I want Raif Badawi, who is one of my dearest friends, one of the biggest liberal advocates, to still have a chance to come to the United States. Uh, in Pakistan, which is also a country ravaged by extremism and, and, and deplorable Taliban people and, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, there is other Rizvi come from Pakistan, Sarah Haider come from Pakistan. I still want to allow a form. It, I am all for restrictions. Like, I mean, I, I support the idea of extreme vetting. I mean, especially from countries that are filled with extremism. That's, that should be common sense, that the people coming from uh, Fallujah, Iraq, uh, have a better chance of becoming terrorists than people coming up from, I don't know, Norway uh, or like, that's, that's, that's just common sense. I mean, this is, this should be common sense for even supposedly liberals who, who, who should actually adhere to this concept. So, I mean, I definitely do not want the next Muslim extremists. I mean, just, just two years ago, I had an event regarding Islamophobia here in New York. And we know in New York, we also have the Book of Mormon, which is, but but the, but we had an event on Islamophobia, and literally there were people, sorry, NYPD, escorting me to enter the event and to leave the event. And even when I go have a cigarette, there is some security guy going outside with me to help me smoke a cigarette. And I was like, if in America, in New York City, of all the places, we are afraid to have an event about Islamic extremism or Islamophobia and so on, then where the hell we should do it, right? I mean, if in New York yeah. we can do, do it, what are we going to do it in like Kabul? So there is definitely the issue of Islamic extremism and, and Islam is definitely an issue that has to be 
uh, extreme measurements. And one of the proposals, uh, back to the seven countries stuff, and one of the countries, the country that I come from, Iraq, is that in which the United States came to this country and there were many Iraqis work with the U.S. Army as a translators and intelligence and so on, who proved their loyalty to the United States, who proved their loyalty to many of the U.S. Army. Why not hire some of these people and make them do the bidding? They understand the language, they understand the culture, they have a bit of under, uh, understanding of who is who, and then they can ask the right questions. And of all the seven countries, by the way, zero of the refugees have committed a terrorist act in the United States. So zero is, I think that this uh, seven countries, even though they say it was taken from a Obama administration and so on, it's, first of all, it's a place of great concern, obviously, because there's a lot of instability happening in Yemen, a lot of instability happening in Iraq and Syria, because some parts of Iraq are still under the control of ISIS and some parts of Syria are still control of ISIS. Yes, definitely there has to be a special vetting. I've been through that vetting. I was, when I applied to the United States, refugees, they asked me lots of questions and I have to prove right. lots of things. And it took me years before I came to the United States. It, and that was during the quote-unquote the apologist Obama administration, right? That's, that's what that Trump is talking about as them being weak and so on. I came under the Obama administration and it was already so difficult for Iraqis to come from, from the, the, may, it must be there like an extra layer. Why not? Should people be, get asked if they uh, pray five times a day and, and, and whatever, maybe. That, that should be something that maybe they should consider. But that doesn't even say about anything because there are people who pray five times a day who probably support the existence of Israel and, and, and I don't know, they, they, they drink on Thursday. So that does right. not, so, but yeah. So, so, you're, so saying, uh, you're saying you should judge people individually and not as a collective, I think. Exactly. Yes, we should take people case by case scenario. Yeah, and so at the so same time you... have an understanding that some countries are more than just than others, and, and and at the same time have the case by case scenario in order for us to defend the real people that we want as allies, and not to send a signal that everybody who's coming from there is somehow a, a potential terrorist or trying to get us or trying to steal their jobs. I think there is a balance of compassion. At the same time, securing national security. It doesn't have to be, I either have to be uh, tough and, and screw everybody, or I have to be uh, enablist or denialist, open borders uh, clown. There is, there is uh, no answer, which is... Right. Well, that's yeah. in my direct message, which we're going to post tomorrow. That's what I said. It's like we're fighting between people are saying we should have no borders, which is national suicide. That's not what a country is. Yeah. And then people are saying we shouldn't have any immigrants which is the most, ant it's the antiquated antithesis of what America actually is. So I'm curious, if, if this ban, which we now know is a 90-day temporary ban while they figure out the vetting process. Inshallah, it inshallah, what? right? Inshallah, yeah. I've got it. Well. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Inshallah, like we shall days. see. 90 okay. days, yeah. But if he had said, we're not putting any specific countries on here, but we're pausing the entire thing. No, we're not singling out a specific country. But for 90 days, we are pausing this, except for the most extreme individual cases where someone might be killed tomorrow or something like that. Would you have basically been okay with that idea, where we're not singling out the countries, but just so we can figure out what's going on, which obviously a lot of people want, and I think you're hinting is a, or I think you said, is basically a legitimate argument to figure out what's going on with vetting. Would you have basically been okay with that? Yeah, well, well I mean, uh Terms and conditions apply. I mean, there are so many people right now who are on the pipeline of coming to the United States as, as refugees and immigrants. And many of these people, I mean, for example, like me, when I came here to the United States and they said I will be accepted in the next, I mean, for me, because I'm a single man, they probably make it until the last and they tell you you're going to be accepted. So let's say some people are already told them that they, are, they were accepted as refugees to come to the United States and that they have houses and they have stuff that they have to sell or whatever, like whatever uh, jobs that they have to quit and so on. Um, it's, I think that to say that, okay, we're going to delay you for the next, uh, I don't know, 90 days until we figure out what the hell is going on is and also like, I mean, within that time period, there are going to be lots of students. I mean, I'm listening to lots of stories of students who came to the United States under scholarship and, and stuff, and they're going to come here 
they're going to study and most of them are going to come back, except what the notion is that they're going to stay here and apply for asylum. Actually, most of them want to come back and uh, develop Iraq and the countries that we want to get their extremism from. And something like this, I think if it's going to be done within a gradual level and, and it's going to be done intelligently, I mean, I think we all acknowledge that there is a problem. There is a problem within jihadism, there's a problem with Islamism. I think that except that the denialists that are not called that just like the climate climate change skeptics like denialists there is the islamist denialists the people who don't acknowledge there's a problem called islamism unless other than these people most people acknowledge that there is a problem within the muslim world i mean Fahra zakaria for example called a cancer of extremism growing in the muslim world every i mean most people acknowledge that the question is how can you deal with it and at the same time you don't antagonize the people that we want we want as allies because what I'm afraid of, in, in something like complete ban and so on, is going to turn the conversation as a war between the East and the West and a clash of civilization. And Dave Rubin, the guy who grew up in New York and Faisal who grew up in Baghdad, are enemies because of the countries they were born into. And this kind of concept of clash of civilization is going to empower the worst people in the universe. It's going to empower the ISIS of the world, and it's going to empower the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists of the world, because these, and, and also the leaders are source of the world, right? The ones who, who want to utilize all of this discussion on their advantage. So we I, have For the to record, she banned me on Twitter. I was going to ask her to come on the show. But uh, she blocked Well, me. I mean, I've, I've been on a debate with her. So uh, it, yeah, it, she's, so, she's one of the most difficult people to, to have a discussion with. So anyway, so like I, I'm afraid that this kind of, of language that Trump administration have used, have used and, and the policies that it's talking about is going to, I mean, uh, is going to disadvantage the best allies that we have in the fight. I mean, I remember back in Iraq in 2007, in which the United States created this idea called the surge. And I said, send the surge, and there was a guy, General David Petraeus, mm -hmm. and he was working uh, with people called the Awakening Forces, the Sunni forces. Most of them are quote unquote moderates, mo mo more conservative than I want them to be. But anyway, they were our best allies, and, and there were many areas in which Al Qaeda used to be having safe zones. In which was the United States Army built alliances with some of the Sunni Muslims and started defeating Al Qaeda. And Al Qaeda was getting defeated area after area. I mean, thanks to President Obama, with all the forces to screw all the work. But, <laughs> but, the, but that's the, a whole other topic. That's all they're talking about. But the concept of building alliances with, with Muslims and trying to work out with Muslims to defeat extremism, I think is a great idea. And not to make it into Muslims are terrorists, white people are civilized, and all of this polarized thinking. And eventually, what we're all getting is more polarization and more hates and more divisions. And I think that voices like us, and, and, and you, thanks so much for Great, you know, great show is that you're trying to prevent that. And, and I think that neither Trump, I don't think Trump as one of the guys who, who are part of the solution. Right. So I understand that, that people, there's a certain amount of people that no matter what Trump is going to do, are going to say he's up to no good. He's up to no good. Definitely, what I yeah. tried to say on Twitter, and maybe I didn't quite get it out perfectly, was that, and it was, oh, it was related to you exactly, because I didn't understand this piece about the green card, that I thought that if they had a full understanding of what it would do to someone like you, someone that's here via a green card, that is doing such good work for the fighting of these terrible ideas, that that wouldn't be intentional. Now, it sounds like at first they were going to ban the people with green cards, so that yeah. potentially if you left you wouldn't be allowed to get back in. Then it sounded like, yes, you would be allowed to get back in. Last I heard, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Is that right? Yeah, well, they said they're going to do additional screening. But, but, I, uh, screening. but I have a minor disagreement with you. Maybe it's minor, maybe it's major. It depends who's watching. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's well-intentioned. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, there is also, I mean, I, I don't I, know I, that it's well-intentioned. My hope is that it was, it was a missing piece. Yeah, I, yeah, but you, I mean, you're probably right. Yeah, I don't think it is. I mean, just like there are people who say that, well, like, I actually started disagreeing with them as, as well, is that they say, like, oh, these Democrats who are pandering to the Muslims are just well-intentioned. Well, what if they just want to get their votes and they're pandering to them? How do you know they're well-intentioned? Do you have a PhD in psychoanalysis? Like, no, nobody knows. I mean, I think for the Trumpistan people, they... Uh, they just don't care. They, I think they, many of them just don't care. They think that, like, oh, who cares if there is, like, 
uh, Iraqi secularists or whatever doing the fight. Uh, these people are their culture and, and they're our enemies. I, and I hope to be wrong. I, I would love to be wrong on this. Uh, but I, what, I've, what I've seen so far is that what I have seen is mostly the, the, the kind of like a conversation, a debate between Pamela Geller on one side and Linda Sassur on the other. And that is like doomsday scenario. And we're seeing kind of a doomsday scenario with Donald Trump. And I, and right. I don't uh, think that, that he is actually well intentioned. I don't think he just, I don't think he has that nuanced inf- uh, knowledge. Maybe some people, like, for example, General Mattis, is someone I actually deeply respect. And I think he's a very intelligent guy, military guy. But at the same time, I don't think Trump understands most of the nuances of the conversation. And uh, also from his previous conversations about, like, Islam hates us. Like, okay. That's like a very cliche. Uh, talk about right. the differences here. Like, I don't think he really understands. He sees he sees Arabs, Muslims, all oh, these bad guys or whatever. And uh, our people, America first, America, we're going to defend itself. I don't think he really understands the complexities of the world that we're facing today. Yeah, so just to be very clear about your green card situation, as it's understood yeah. right now, potentially you could go give your talk with Ali Rizvi in Canada, who's a Muslim reformer, a great, great guy, but potentially you could be stopped, you would be, we know you would get extra screening, and the risk for you is that something goes wrong with the screening and you can't get back in. That is what you could be faced with. Exactly, and I mean, as, as you probably have traveled a lot and you never know what the officer, how, how bad he is. I mean, I mean, I've heard the stories, I've sent you the article on NPR in which some of the officers were asking the people to sign a form, which is kind of canceling your green card form, in which people probably will file, fold the form and then their green card will be forfeited and then they will not be able to enter the United States to begin with. So yeah. you're going to be, I mean, I, I consulted, I have not consulted with lawyers so far, but I've consulted with some of my friends who, Pretty much 99% advised me not to leave the country. They're like, it's too much high risk. And even though I told them that all my speeches are going to be counter, about countering extremism and so on, they said, well, you're going to be coming with a law, with an officer, immigration officer who doesn't know what the hell, who are you? They're going to say, like, face us, Idol Matar, seize the travel document and seize your birth of place is Iraq. And it's under seven countries, and you're like, okay, stand in the line, we're gonna check your cell phone, we're gonna check whatever. And then you're like, oh, you made a joke about ISIS? Oh, wow, you're a member of ISIS. And, and then. <laughs> I don't want them checking your phone. I mean, you send me some funny stuff about ISIS, <laughs> then I'll be in trouble yeah, too. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, so you never know. Like, so, uh, and I made this joke before, not to change the subject, I made this joke before. I said, if you want to join ISIS, change, uh, join them, because change comes from within. Mm-hmm. Okay? And I was banned from Facebook for 30 days because of that joke. So imagine if someone like a Department of Homeland Security guy sees a joke like this, and you're like, oh, you're saying that we should join ISIS, and, and you go back to your, your country, or we're going to send you to Guantanamo Bay. So it's like, it's a, it's a very high risk to actually go, because you're going to be, you don't know who's the officer. I mean, I, I've traveled to Canada back and forth multiple times, and I've had many officers who are very friendly, and they're like, welcome to America, and whatever. But once I also got like some guy who like, I don't know, like I think he was like hating me. He was like, uh, what are you doing here? What were you doing there? I'm like, what? I'm, I was having like a birthday party. Like, what do you think I was doing? And I was, and, and you never know. So sometimes you get a bad officer who's gonna be like, you know what, you're from Iraq. I, I think that you don't deserve to be here or whatever. And then, and make you sign a form to forfeit your green card. And then your green card can get canceled and you never get to back to this country. and. Yeah, so it's a very high risk. Yeah, and that's, that's why I wanted to do this with you today and especially do it live where I don't have any notes or anything because you, to me, are the best face that we can put on this of whether it was well-intentioned or not well-intentioned or whatever, we don't have to split hairs with any of that stuff. It doesn't even matter. But the simple fact is that someone like you and you are not the only one like you, you're one of a kind, but there are some other people like you well, uh, that that you could potentially, even at our Canadian border, be stopped, and then potentially have to go back to Iraq, which would literally, at this point, be a risk to your life. Exactly, yeah, and, and um, so, so the, I mean, the, the, I mean that, that's kind of a major issue that I'm kind of being stuck in, is that 
and, and I still, I mean, obviously, I still love this country. I, 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 I would, uh, would love to live here as, as much as I want. Uh, but I, I kind of felt really disappointed that this, this kind of a blanket discrimination. Uh, I don't really, I mean, you know me very well. I don't really blame the victim cards my whole life. Like, even though many people are like, oh, your story is so horrific and you've been through a lot and stuff. And I actually hardly talk about my story. I don't even make my story to be the central point of my life. But seeing that kind of treatment kind of make me felt felt really sad, made me really felt like a, a victim of some sort. I mean, I, I like, what did I do to actually deserve such treatment? And, yeah. uh, but, but at the same course, time- again, it's why it's the individual versus the collective. So I'm curious, what would you say, you know my audience, yeah. I think pretty well. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that my audience is all over the place politically. I have alt-right people watching. I have far-left yeah. progressives watching. I got libertarians and classical liberals and everybody. And I think it's pretty well mixed across the board on all that. So yeah. what would you say directly to the people that fall a little more in the, in the alt-right category or in the Trump category that they hear ISIS say, you know what, we're gonna take advantage of the refugee situation, right? We know ISIS is saying this and they've done it in Europe, yeah. that we're, we're, we want our fighters to get through these borders. And then people see, you know, the, the truck thing in, uh, was that in France? Yeah, uh, Berlin, and, yeah. And, and the theater shooting and all of the stuff that's happening in Germany and the rapes that are happening in Sweden, all of that stuff. And for even all of them, that I'll give them all the benefit of the doubt and they'll say, wait a minute, Obviously, Faisal is not like this. But for the people that hear those messages, what, what would you say to them about their legitimate concerns? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't deny their concerns. These concerns are real. Islamic extremism is a real concern uh, that I'm not trying to deny. Uh, the, what I'm trying to tell them is that by making a, making a blanket statement or making a blanket policy like what we had with the Trump ban and so on, you are, obviously there is no rational reason to join ISIS. I mean, I, I've, I've got this from my liberals who say, oh, if we're gonna ban refugees, this ba refugees are joining ISIS. Well, you're actually, you're not helping by saying this shit because you're saying that, that you're saying that these people are actually potential terrorists and if you just trigger them, they're gonna join ISIS. You're not I saw them. so many celebrities yes. with huge Twitter following saying this, if you ban them, they'll become terrorists. Exactly, what? so, so so to my message to the aggressive leftists and all these Hollywood celebrities, you're not helping at all, okay? Like even with all my disappointment, I will never get to join ISIS. I'm gonna like drink margaritas and eat falafels and probably get stuck in New York and like, I don't know, go to Brooklyn. Like I, that's pretty much I, I would do if I get stuck in America, even with all my disappointment. I'm not gonna join ISIS. I'm not gonna join a terrorist group. Uh, Margaritas and falafel. Does that yeah, mix? That kind of mixes. Well, uh, I mean, how, the best way to trigger the, the alt right, right? Like Mexican food. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, is that sorry, Mexican drinks and Arab, Arabic food. So anyway, the the so when it comes to the alt right people and the Trump supporters and stuff, is that when you are making the general general statement that all of the people over there are somehow threats, and uh, we have to have bans and uh, it's. Uh, we have to make Newcomb or something like all of these comments that I see on the internet or somebody like me or Al Rizvi and stuff are kind of accused of taqiyya that you are kind of lying in the defense of Islam and there's like I get accusations. Oh by the way, a, a Twitter egg did tell me you're a double agent today. So <laughs> yeah, if, yeah, you're, yeah. if you're a double agent, you're really, really good by the way. Yeah, I mean my mouth thinks I'm smart, so I'm just proving it right. Yeah, um, so like someone like this in which someone like me just because of my culture of origin and so on is somehow trying to bring Sharia law to America in the guise of atheism. Like are you fucking kidding me? Like. Shoot me. Anyway, so so this is kind of a mentality that like everybody from there is a threat. Everybody from there, we have to uh, be worried about them and so on. This kind of mentality is also not helping. We are we are talking about the celebrities and the regressive left and all these people, but the other mentality that that generalizes. I mean, both of them are based on rationality. So. What I would ask them is that to look at people like us and to look at people who are standing for the values of the US Constitution and human rights and so on, and other than complaining and, and putting Pepe the Frog as your profile picture, well, try at least maybe donating your skill to help some of us or try to spread the good words and, and, and show that there are people who are really fighting 
that for the same values that you are supposedly trying to defend, assuming that they actually believe in liberal values and human rights and so on, assuming, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but the, so if you want people who, if you want more Faisals, if you want more Al-Rizbis, well, support people like me and make them do the fight to actually do the fight against extremists. And then just like what we had 50 years ago, I mean, Iraq, you look at the pictures of Iraq, you look at the pictures of Iran, you look at, the situation was not as bad as you, the, the, ISIS and stuff, it's not always been the case. There are there have been cases within the, the Middle East that now would concern the states of concern and so on, in which there were beautiful fashion shows in Tehran and and women wearing skirts in Baghdad and there are cinemas. Well, if we if if, if Baghdad was the case that is the seventies, we can make Baghdad great again. Yeah. As we well should. I mean you see those pictures from what Lebanon was like you know 30 years ago. Lebanon is still basically w westernized compared to a lot of the rest Some of the Middle East. Sense, yeah. but, but you see pictures, especially of Iran and Iraq and whatever, and it's like, wow, that did exist. People, as Bill Maher would say, women don't want to live in beekeeper costumes. They, they would rather be in bikinis, but I would argue they should be in whichever one they want. They should just have the choice. They, they should have the choice. And, uh, but at the same time, it's fair to say that like this, trends of 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 big, uh, burkas and stuff and that's also a message for my liberal friends these are symbols of misogyny if you are a feminist and you defend the right for because the concept behind these including the hijab is modesty culture it's modesty culture is that the idea that men cannot control their lusts and women have to cover up because if they don't cover up they're going to be raped and they're going to be attacked and that concept is, has risen up as a result of so many reasons, the Cold War and the support of the Saudis and stuff. But things can actually, I think that with, this, with, the, with the power of technology, with the power of, of connectivity and so on, we can actually expedite that conversion back to what things were before and maybe make them better. I mean, Arab, National Arab Socialism, which kind of what kind of made some of that secular building, has failed, maybe we need a new system other than Arab National Socialism. And I think with the, with the power of, of technology and the power of connectivity and education and, 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 and so on, I think that these are the people that we should support. And this is where the Trump supporters and others should be focusing more on, than just to focus on the negative stuff and generalize it and make it as the whole situation. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I, we could go on forever, but I just want to do two more things. And then sure. we'll do this. Hopefully, hopefully in two or three weeks, you're going to be in L.A. Yeah, so, yeah. So we'll do a live. Oh, but just two you. quick things. Um, first off, you, you've hinted at this a lot, and it's obviously been a through line of what I've done on this show. But being abandoned by the left, since, since they abandoned me in sort of an ideological sense, but they've abandoned you as a human being. Uh, can you just give me like a two minute feeling of, of what happened there? And I know we've talked about this a lot, but I, I just sense, we've texted about this, like just an yeah. exhaustion at this point that we tried yeah. so hard. And it's not just us. There's people that are a lot more influential than both of us. But we tried. And I, I yeah. really feel like we've lost, but I do have hope, which will get to my next question. Yeah, I mean, um, so I mean, I, I've mentioned that, I think, on the show, and also my Nawaz mentioned it, called, called the liberal betrayal. The liberal betrayal, sorry. So... I mean, if you take a, take a Western liberal and Hillary Clinton supporter and so on, and you ask them about the questions about, do you support same-sex marriage? Do you support, are you pro-choice? Do you support climate change? Do you support, I agree with almost everything. Like I agree, uh, do you support safety nets for poor people? I agree with almost everything that Democrats support when it comes to the major issues. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm kind of right compared to Bernie Sanders and all of the people on the, on the far left, but I consider myself kind of a yeah. center If you're right of Bernie, you're a Nazi, you know yeah, that. Yeah, 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 so I mean, I, I'm, I'm Nazi on Wednesday. So anyway, um, so that being said, on the issue of, of Islamic extremism, you change the subject to, so I mean, I, I've had this debate before. I said, what do you call a Republican, white Republican who gets, gets same-sex marriage? He said, I call him a bigot. Thank you for calling 99% Muslims bigots. And he said, no, I never said that. So, so, so this kind of, I mean, there are two kinds of racism happening. There is racism of lower expectations from the left, and there is racism of higher expectations from the far right. In which they expect me, <laughs> just because of, I'm one person, I can defeat all Islamic extremists, extremists of being an Iraqi refugee with like a 
uh, <laughs> limited amount of funding. Is that so? There is a so the races of lower expectations. I feel my, I feel that I have been betrayed by both sides. I've, I've been betrayed by both of the extremes. Um, and obviously, I have a lot of following, and, and there are many people who support me. What I think you are alluding to in the next point. So. Yes, I mean, I feel extremely betrayed by the left because I share so much agreements with them and seeing that, I mean, even within the last years of the Obama administration, I looked at some, some of the funding, the grants that he has given uh, to support countering violent extremism, and I saw it, many of them going to Islamist groups who support uh, Sharia law and so on, and you would be like, so you are a Democrat who supports separation of church and state, who supports same-sex marriage. Why don't you support the same people who agree with you? Like, why Why do you support people who think that we should impose the hijab and, and, the, and the modesty culture? Like, and that's, and why are liberals, seculars in the Middle East not being funded while you're already giving the money? At least give it to the right people. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that betrayal of continuous betrayal, eight years of the Obama administration, even though I'm, I received an award from Obama, by the way. I mean, I, I oh, like yeah. the guy. And I'm, I'm happy for many things he's done. But at the same time, I would say, unfortunately, he has been wrong a lot on that issue of Islamic Islamism. And considering that I would have actually, if I was an American citizen, I would have voted for Obama. But, but, but at the same time, I feel that will kind of like make it like, you used to love your ex-girlfriend and she betrays you and she cheats on you and you feel like you're being cheated. Very different than with the right. I, I don't have that big of dislike of the right because I've never considered myself part of the right. Like I, on some issues maybe, but overall, I don't support Sarah Pell and all this basket of deplorables. Yes, I mean, I, I support some of the concepts of the rights, people like James Kerchick and some conservatism and capitalism, but overall, I don't support this kind of Christian right nonsense that unfortunately dominated the Republican Party. So I feel extremely betrayed by the left compared to others. Yeah, okay, so then that brings me to the last thing, which I think you know where I'm going with this, which is that I now firmly believe, and I'm gonna devote myself to it for at least the next year, that the new center is here. I think it's already yes. here. And I think it includes you, and I think it includes Sam Harris, and Majid Nawaz, and Ali Rizvi, and many, many of the, and Sarah Hader, and plenty of the other people I've had on the show. And interestingly, I also think it includes people on the right that we wouldn't have thought were allies. Yeah. For example, I, I somebody, so somebody a guy like Ben Shapiro, who you probably would have huge differences with, and yeah. maybe this is where me and you wouldn't totally see eye to eye, but I see him as a little more libertarian who, who is not bigoted. And I think we can, it doesn't mean we all have to be in the same political party, but I say new center as people who really want liberty and people to be looked at as individuals and free. So what can we do to push that? Whether you agree with me on Ben or not, it's a moot point, but you can address no, that no, if you I, want. I'm not gonna stuck with you on Ben Shapiro, but yeah, I, sure. I, I definitely agree that, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've, I get like, I mean, obviously I get lots of hate mail, but at the same time, <laughs> I get lots of emails of people who say, I love your perspective. I, I'm tired of this polarization of left and right. I think you make sense. And I get that from people on the right and people on the left. And as I said, like, there are many people on the right that I consider friends, people like James Kerchick and, and Aaron Kessler and others who, who I uh, also consider uh, who are center right or Republicans and probably moderate Republicans. Yes, of course, I would uh, say, I mean, it depends on what you define as statement of principles. Um, and there is a growing movement happening there. And there is people who are sick and tired of both of the polar opposites. And they feel that the, the, that, that like uh, subjects like free speech, uh, subject like to women's rights, what's what's happening, who are at, at least now with the people of power, they don't represent them. But at the same time, I mean, I consider myself politically homeless, and I'm always looking for a home. And I think that something like the new center would definitely be my home. People who believe in, I mean, we can disagree on how much we should tax the rich and we should have right. universal health care or not. I mean, yes, we can have disagreements on that, but on the basic principles. We all support free speech and we all support secularism. Um, probably women's rights is something I would include there and same-sex marriage and so on. So, I mean, if people would agree on these principles, definitely. I mean, I, I, I do consider, I mean, you mentioned people like Ben Shapiro, I do consider them to be kind of very more socially conservative than, than to my, uh, so I don't think that he is uh, okay with many of their values. I think he still believes in the 
Judeo-Christian nonsense and all of these kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, the reason but, I can include a guy like him, by the way, is because when I've had him here in my house just a few weeks ago, he said, even though he personally is for traditional marriage, he said he doesn't want the government to be involved. So even that, I can take as a little win. So I don't mean we, he, I'm with he, you. We don't yeah. all have to agree on everything. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it can be layers. I mean, it can be, I mean, I generally, as long as people agree on the concept of intellectual conversation, honest conversation, civil conversation, the concept of civil disagreements, uh, it's something I'm actually starting to devalue so much because right now there's hardly the concept of civil disagreement. It's either you're a racist, neo-Nazi uh, evil or you're like a far leftist communist uh, evil. Like there is hardly like, OK, I agree with you on some things, I disagree on some things and we can still be friends and we can still probably form a political party together. I, I really would value that regardless of our maybe I, I would say minor disagreements. Yeah, Faisal, we we agree on too much. This is this yeah, is yeah that, fun. Uh, actually, that should be an episode. That Arab and a Jew agree so much. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you change the world, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, it's always a pleasure. Next time yeah. we're going to do this over beers or wine or something else. Let's yeah. get you. You shouldn't be smoking cigarettes anymore, by the yeah, way. Yeah. Let's get well, you off the cigarettes. Let's have, let's have kosher wine and hookah. How about that? Eh, kosher wine ain't great. I'll get you something <laughs> good from Sonoma. <laughs> All right, brother. It's been a pleasure talking to you, oh, and fun. I'll see you in a couple weeks. See you in a couple weeks. Take care. All right, ciao.